I'd like to welcome our viewers to our conversations with the authors of the Journal of Educational Controversy. We are a journal that is published at the Woodring College of Education at Western Washington University. My name is Lorraine Casperson, and I'm the editor of the journal. With me today is my co-interviewer, Professor John Richardson, uh, who is Professor Emeritus at Western Washington University. Uh, with expertise in the field of the sociology of education. Uh, John is also the associate editor for the, uh, for the journal. My guest today is Curtis Acosta, uh, who published an article in our upcoming issue of the journal called Dangerous Minds in Tucson, the Banning of Mexican-American Studies and Critical Thinking in Arizona. Mr. Acosta was a teacher for 20 years in the Tucson, Arizona uh, school district where he taught the highly acclaimed Mexican-American uh, curriculum. Curtis is an award-winning uh, educator who has been featured in the documentary Precious Knowledge uh, and in profiles by CNN, PBS, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Uh, he is also the founder of the Ocosta Latino Learning Partnership, an educational consulting firm uh, that, is, that is designed to help educators create dynamic uh, learning environments. Uh, Curtis is also taking his doctorates at the University of uh, Arizona in the field of teaching, learning, and sociocultural studies. The uh, Mexican-American curriculum that Curtis taught for many years was outlawed by the state of Arizona in a very highly politically charged environment. The incident sparked a nationwide debate over just which populations and whose voices are heard in the public schools uh, of, our, of our nation. As a result, the journal is publishing uh, a special issue on the theme, who defines the public in public education? And Mr. Ocosto's article will appear in that issue. Let me welcome very much to our program, uh, Mr. Curtis Ocosto. Thank welcome. you, Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> I Thank thought, you. I thought we might begin by uh, trying to provide some kind of background to the events that led up to all of this. Mm. Um, for our viewers who may not be familiar, the state legislature in Arizona passed a piece of legislation uh, that had the following provisions, and I'll just um, uh, read them. Uh, the legislation said that, um, uh, that um, it was against any program, uh, let's see, how, it was legislation House Bill 2281, and it prohibits a school district or a charter school from including courses or classes that promote the overthrow of the United States government or promote resentment toward a race or a class of people or who advocate ethnic solidarity instead of the treatment of pupils as individuals. There was one other provi provision that was struck down then by the court later. Um, so that was the, the, uh, the legislation that sparked all of this controversy. Uh, Curtis, could you give us an idea of how you got caught up in all of this? What were the events leading up to it? And why was your program targeted? Well, um, Lorraine, it was about a, a seven-year struggle um, to uh, th that uh, or crusade <laughs> that from the language of uh, some state officials uh, from their rhetoric uh, 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 in Arizona. Um, our now Attorney General, Tom Horn, um, who was state superintendent at the time, and, uh, and now our uh, uh, new state superintendent, John Hoopenthal, um, pretty much used our, our courses as a, as a way of uh, creating a wedge issue. Um, in, in, uh, in order to get elected. At least that's, that, that, that's how I, I perceive it now. Um, so it really started in 2006. Now our program had been around uh, a, a bit longer than that. <clears throat> and we were having some really uh, 
really good uh, academic uh, uh, results. You know, the outcomes were, were wonderful. We, we, uh, our, our students were highly engaged in, in school. Um, they, were, uh, they were participating in, uh, in uh, civically uh, in the, in, in th throughout Tucson, um, and they were also uh, participating as activists as well. Um, you know, in their lives outside of the space, and sometimes, in, in, and definitely advocating for social justice issues within the school themselves. So they were an empowered group of critical thinkers and learners, and, and we we're doing that simply like uh, one of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues, uh, Sean Arce, uh, who was our director of Mexican American Studies, said it was revolutionary. And they're like, uh, people go, oh, and they go, yeah, we were teaching kids to read and write, and, <laughs> and so. So in this day and age where so much of this is test preparation and scripted curriculums and, and, and really we see the, almost the, um, the disempowerment of the, of the teacher as a scholar, as a, as a learner themselves, as, as, as somebody who, who uh, can cultivate and create um, dynamic and, um, and rigorous education. Uh, we had that opportunity and we, were, we had great results. And so, um, so along those lines, um, we also uh, we got attention, um, and uh, and uh, so the really the really the the moment I think that really lit the fuse uh, that that gave these because uh, most of the, the the gentlemen that I, I, I spoke about uh, Tom Horn and and John Hoopenthal they're from Phoenix not Tucson so all of this um, unrest was a hundred miles away from us so uh, I, I just was speaking to some folks here and. Uh, Washington and I was saying you know it would make my <coughs> it would make my um, AP government high school AP government teachers head spin to, to think that like um, you know the, the, the local control was seized by the Republican Party because you know growing up the, the old you know tea chart we made on one side Republicans were about you know go, li, small government and staying out of people's business but that, that, that paradigm has shifted and most definitely in this case um, where, where, where folks a hundred miles away who didn't want to visit the program, who didn't want to really know it intimately, um, wanted the wi their will to be followed. Um, conversely, a community who actually was participating in the program intimately, mm -hmm. s parents, students of course, and other community members knew, us, knew what we were doing, were, were advocating to, to protect the program. But in 2006, uh, Dolores Huerta came to speak uh, Tucson High School where I teach and she uh, she had this great speech where she was was laying down the complexities of immigration the the immigration debates at the time the immigration policies the Sensenbrenner bill and she was also talking about the war and she said the uh, Iraq war at the time and she, she it was her this is her my summary of, of, of some of her key points she she was saying that the, the, the reason for these immigration um, this immigration debate was a distraction for the for, from the the cost of the war and, and what we were doing in, in the Middle East. And, and, and she said a statement that just flew out of her mouth. She was rolling. Uh, and she's a civil rights hero that she is. She, uh, she, was, she was feeling it. And she said, Republicans hate Latinos. So that little phrase that was embedded in this much larger context became something that Bill O'Reilly and Fox News nationally, and then of course locally, um, what's going on? And, and at that time, uh, Tom Horn was, didn't even know who Dolores Huerta was, was saying derogatory things about she was Cesar Chat once he, once he found out her relationship to the United Farm Workers Movement and her, her historical relevance, he, he minimized her accomplishments, reduced it down to being Cesar Chavez's girlfriend, you know, anything far, you know, all this stuff far from the truth and, and really derogatory type of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of addressing a, a civil rights hero. And, uh, but that was the moment. So Tom Horn came to Tucson um, to give a counter speech and uh, he had his assistant superintendent uh, Margaret Garcia Dugan um, give a speech and um, he also gave a fax of lists of things that the students could and couldn't do. The students had asked for a Q&A, a sit down with their state superintendent. You would think that that would be completely reasonable. He is their state superintendent mm -hmm. but um, he, he forbid that. Uh, he forbid signage, he forbid any type of uh, backpacks couldn't come in nothing like the students were to be escorted into the space sit down and be very domesticated listen and then leave his leave leave his space which ironically was their space their auditorium their high school mm -hmm. and the students were upset about that and they, they launched a pretty in, in, ingenious little plan 
where they, uh, they wore on white t-shirts, you can silence my voice but never my spirit, and they wore outer clothes, layers that, um, that you all know in the Northwest real well. You know, you got to layer up. And so uh, they, uh, they took off, at one point, a student leader, uh, Arnold Montiel, took off his, his shirt and stood up during the speech and then put blue duct tape on his mouth and as a, as a symbolic mm -hmm. gesture of, 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 of silencing student voice. And, uh, and a bunch of, uh, we have those spring-loaded chairs in the auditorium, mm -hmm. so you hear boom, 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 about 100 students, 50 to, uh, well, 75 to 100, I would say, students stood up silently. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Horn later said they put their fist in the air and they were disrespectful. And that was, uh, you can go back in the archives of the, of the newspaper at that time and find that, that nothing, was, nothing was never mentioned about that. And I was in that auditorium, I didn't see that either. And, uh, but they made their, they, they, they were, their statement was pretty, was loud, e even though it was mm -hmm. silent. Um, and it was creative as heck. And, uh, and that became a moment, mm -hmm. I think, that, that took us in a direction that, um, that, that we, we found ourselves seven years later losing our program. However, even before the speech, Tom Horn had walked into um, Tucson High and been interviewed by the, by the, by the Arizona Daily Star. And that, 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 at that time, they had uh, video interviews that they put online. And we ca I can't find those. Hopefully, someday somebody can. But he said, I will see the end of this program, even before the incident that I just said. Mm -hmm. So I think um, he had found himself a new, uh, a new pinata to hit. Mm -hmm. He had uh, earlier been elected on English only and ending bilingual education. And he ran for state superintendent on, uh, on his record in Paradise Valley School District of ending women's studies. So he had a, quite a track record of, 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 of regressive and oppressive type of uh, platforms that could launch him into office. Yeah. You know, there have been so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about your program. Um, I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about what was the content of the courses and mm -hmm. what, what was the pedagogical approach that you used? Yeah, the pedagogical approach was actually something that, you know, we, we were definitely a group of teachers that embraced critical pedagogy, the idea of critical thinking, the idea of empowering students to be able to, to analyze the world and, and, and to find their own path in it and to, to uh, you know, to the Fredian, you know, Paulo Freire, like conscientization, right? The idea of, of, of being able to examine the world and seeing the, the, the restraints upon their lives and be able to then transform, you know, build an analysis and build a plan to transform those restraints or those obstacles in their lives. So we were definitely, um, we, were, we were about that type, creating that type of discourse, that type of freedom. And we, came, and, and, and we also uh, grabbed our own funds of knowledge, you know, uh, Luis Moll, Norman Gonzalez, and, and Kathy Amati's work in Tucson is actually, um, uh, you know, the, the, the term funds of knowledge, the, the educational um, theory of, of the, the fact that your communities are, 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 are steeped with resources and academic, um, academic um, uh, opportunities to engage in school. Uh, but it, the, the, the charge should be for schools to, to go and reap and, and investigate and, and find those funds of knowledge in the community, the cultural capital, the social capital that can be used then in the classroom as a basis mm -hmm. to build. So our own indigenous epistemologies that we had in the classroom, which were all around, around uh, that we used in the classroom, which are all around human, uh, rehumanizing education. So there's a concept, a Mayan concept, in La Quesh, that we use. So, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. And there's a poem written by Luis Valdez where he has a stanza where he talks about in La Quesh. And we, um, we would use that uh, as a daily recitation, but also to reinforce the principle of, of, uh, of why we're doing this. Why, 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 why gain an education? Why are we here in school if it's not to make a better world, if it's not to see each other as this human potential in one another and to help each other reach that potential. And then we had um, also some, some uh, what, what folks would say Aztec, but we, um, we called Mexica, the Mexica principles. So there was indigenous principles that we had learned through the codices and, and, and from our elders that, uh, that, uh, that we were taught and we applied those to the classroom. The concepts like Tezcatlipoca, which is self-reflection, Quetzalcoatl, precious and beautiful knowledge, Huitzilopochtli, the will to act, and Xipetote, transformation. And those are at the center of the calendario, the sunstone, the Aztec sunstone. And so we were able to use that type of a framework and that type of, 
of, of um, tapping into our historical um, knowledge, of the, the knowledge of this continent to serve as like kind of a way of, of framing what we were doing, but also to tap into the, the you know, to, to get rid of those deficit mi mindsets that often permeate, mm -hmm. uh, m you know, uh, mainstream media that, 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 that Latinos don't care about education, that they're not, that, you know, that internalized oppression, but to, ha to know that the wisdom of your, 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 your indigenous uh, ancestors had, uh, had this much knowledge and it was still applicable today, served as a, a way to reinforce um, themselves, you know, on this continent, you know, in this time. So they knew their past, they knew their present, and they could build their own and design their own, uh, their own, uh, you know, journey for the future. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the pedagogical um, lenses. And, we, and so we would use all sorts of different content, you know, everything from, uh, everything from hip hop and, uh, you know, looking at Common and Kanye West at, uh, and, and um, it's a little dated now, uh, but uh, everything now, now Macklemore maybe, you know, and uh, we, we just used that last year. Um, but uh, any, everything from, uh, from, from hip hop to, to historical like documents, um, you know, the maps that are, you know, were used during like the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and, and looking at the ancient um, um, the migration patterns. <clears throat> it was all, you know, whatever, whatever the moment was, wherever the students were leading us, we were making sure that we were tapping into that as much as we knew that we had the, uh, we, we were cultivating the skills that they needed to be, um, to be, uh, to be successful in college and beyond. I often wondered, um, after the students had gone through that kind of experience, um, how did they react to see their, their books being, um, boxed and, and the program being uh, talked about the way it was. Uh, what was the students' reaction to all of this? It was a range of, of reactions, and, and I appreciate that question because, um, you know, so many times um, we can get caught up in the political um, wranglings and forget who, the, who, it, who it really affected. Mm -hmm. So at the end of our program, you had happy middle-aged men in their, you know, from, of European descent and devastated young Chicanitos and uh, uh, Chicanitas, you know, young Chicanos, um, from like middle school up to young men and women uh, uh, who were uh, who were really empowered and excited and had their hope resuscitated. I used to say all that all the time that our job is to resuscitate the hope in education and the belief in changing the world into a better place. And and so they were in tears. Some of them were angry, um, and uh, some of them were stunned and kind of went through this kind of like almost paralysis. Like, what do mm -hmm. I, what, what, what just happened to us? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really proud of their responses were always with those principles in mind of In La Quiche. So it's funny, In La Quiche was used as a way for us to re-examine school and how we should be with one another in the classroom and in the community. And then it became a, something that we reminded ourselves as people attacked us with their rhetoric and, and with their policies that we couldn't, we, we shouldn't go out and couldn't go out and do the same things to them, that we couldn't respond in that type of manner, that we continue to rehumanize Mr. Horn, Mr. Hoopenthal, uh, Dr. Stegman, locally Dr. Petticone, who were really uh, doing awful things to these young people. And we, could, we couldn't, we needed to name the awful things that were happening. Mm -hmm. um, the students needed to name that. And they needed to stand by that, but they couldn't go into this type of a retributional um, mindset, mm -hmm. you know. You know that's n no different than what Thoreau wrote that inspired Gandhi, and Gandhi inspired King, and and those are the those those principles are the ones that we embrace. And uh, but yeah, it really affected them, Lorraine. You know, you had students like I said that weren't eating, that were stressed out, and their parents were intensely worried about. Once the program was taken away, that's when you saw those moments. Up until that point, and it took a little while for us to reestablish ourselves and figure out how to respond. But up until that point, for about five or six years, it just became something the students learned. It's another thing they learned how to participate democratically. They would go to school board meetings. They would voice their opinion to the to the uh, school board during the call of the audience religiously every two weeks. There would be representation. Anywhere from 50 to 300 folks would show up, depending on the severity of the agenda. 
But they were always there participating. They knew who the school board members were. They knew how they were elected. They were learning. They were getting their civics class. Their, 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 it was better than AP, any AP government class that I had, right? And, and, uh, and they were living it. Um, so at that point, when, when the, you know, they, they, they knew to put like, the, the concept of Huitzilopochtli, they, need, they needed to put their, their, um, their beliefs into some type of action. And how they formulated that, you know, we, we could mentor it, we could listen to them, we could empathize, but we never, we weren't, we, we weren't a dogmatic group, you know, and uh, we weren't replacing one dogma with another. Mm -hmm. We were creating space for them to figure out um, how they were going to move forward in this world because that's what we wanted. Once, the, once they walked across that stage with that cap and gown, if they just had some other person's dogma in their mind, um, they were going to be just as lost after, after the moment of high school as as, as, as someone who gets a test prep curriculum and doesn't mm -hmm. ever get to find themselves right now in the classroom and who they are as a human being and as a, and as a scholar and as an intellectual person. So we cultivated their sense of self. That was very much at the core. So they, we also watched them participate uh, through, through hope, their, their activism or their engagement. It wasn't all of our students, but it was many of them, mm -hmm. uh, became something that they did to to feel, um, to, 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 um, to counterbalance that, that hopelessness that so many times people feel and when, they, when they feel like there isn't any empathy or no one's listening to them in the political process. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us are going through that nowadays and, and we didn't feel that at in Tucson because we were too busy uh, um, working, you know, mm -hmm. and being active to, to, to wring our hands. Mm -hmm. I know there was a, a lawsuit that you were involved in and others were involved in. Um, what was the basis of that lawsuit, and what, where, where is it right now? What, what is its uh, status? Yeah, a group of my colleagues and I, who, uh, you know, we were we had met with each other for on on Saturdays is how we got to to really develop who we were, at, you know, in the classroom, um, how we shared this indigenous knowledge that was new to me. Um, how we deepened our socio-political analysis, how we deepened our own theoretical and uh, theoretical foundations. We just met on the weekends with some the caves donuts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and uh, it's a famous don uh, and th the the donuts went away as we got older, and we had to get you know the cholesterol. <laughs> we had to watch our watching those things, and it started to become a lot more fruit and yogurt based uh, <laughs> meetings. But um, before we had professional development mm -hmm. credit for that, we were meeting because we knew it was so nice to have compañeros in, in this type of work and um, and we were able to teach one another and learn from one another um, and grow together intellectually as, as, as a group and and to become better pedagogues and and hopefully better maestras and maestros for our students so that group and then eventually became the same group of folks that that, that sued the state of Arizona so we uh, filed a lawsuit um, in 2010 in the fall of 2010 uh, Against as, against HB 2281, and uh, and uh, and then we added students to it, and that was critical because at the moment we we hoped that the teachers would have standing, um, but we didn't. But the fact that the students were were later adjoined onto the case, they had political, they had uh, they had legal standing, and so it went to the district court, and unfortunately, I mean tragically. Um, our, the judge assigned to our case was the one of, it was the federal judge that was lost in the Gabriel Giffords assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how Tucson, this nexus of, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of uh, or convergence of this awful convergence of these two things met with uh, uh, Judge Roll, uh, or Judge Roll's death. Um, we were assigned a, a, a Ninth Circuit judge, uh, Judge A. Wallace Tashima, um, to preside over the case, and uh, it took a while, but um, Finally, the, uh, his ruling came out uh, March of, uh, of, of this year, and, uh, and we were uh, unsuccessful on three. Uh, uh, they severed the law. You mentioned that earlier. Um, the one part that was actually um, found unconstitutional was designing uh, curriculum for a particular ethnic group. So we, we actually, our advocacy, our, <coughs> our, our own activism, in challenging that state law was successful on one part. Now we're going to the Ninth Circuit uh, Court, uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, and uh, and we, th that was that was filed uh, uh, within a month, mm -hmm. um, in a this last April, 
Um, and uh, you know, Washington is tied to that, your state, because uh, Seattle University is, has been uh, working on our appeal. Um, like, I mean, I'm so uh, humbled mm -hmm. by the amount of time, effort that that, that school has given our case. Um, they're just firmly believers in it. And, uh, um, among they, and they've put a collection of other legal minds together to help our, our attorney, Richard Martinez, as we go for the ninth, uh, in front of the ninth. And that'll probably be a year from now, and we'll, uh, we, but uh, we won't know for, um, usually they assign from what, the, m m what our attorney tells us is, usually they don't tell us, like they don't tell um, the lawyers and the participants in the case until about a month out. Um, but usually there's about a 12 to 16 month window. So a year from now we might have some new news um, as, as we appeal, uh, where it's a First Amendment void for vagueness argument. For, so you're basing it upon First Amendment violations. Right, yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to join us with some mm -hmm. thoughts? Um, I, I, can, I assume that the rationale for Horn and company, especially the sentence or the, I, pr the statement that you kind of quoted, uh, the, the rationale being, well, let's cut to it, uh, a fear of uh, a cultural group, mm. um, whatever it might be, <coughs> of gaining <coughs> wow, of gaining strength, of gaining political strength, especially uh, by way of uh, by way of their own active instruction and scholarship and debate and and struggles, intellectual struggles. Um, I would imagine that they don't come out and say it that way. <laughs> say the reason we're, we're shutting you down is because. But what struck me, and now strikes me even more, is that there are parallels. Um, I'm not going to say throughout history, but uh, I was thinking of um, of slavery. Reading the Bible was prohibited, mm. uh, and I was thinking about workers in in uh, late 18th century in England in factories in late 18th and well late 18th who were taking time, young kids um, uh, in the factories would take an hour, let's say, mm -hmm. and read this and read that, and, uh, and, and actually some instructors or professors from the university would come in, and they would teach, and um, n not you know where they came from, working class analysis or anything like that, but they would teach about algebra, uh, and they became very proficient. And that led to the shutting down of those practices, and eventually the uh, compulsory school attendance laws uh, in 1880. Um, but it also led to the mechanic institutes. So you can't do it inside factories. And, and their argument was that it was, uh, it was unhealthy. <laughs> you know? um, the, uh, the, the, the similar the representative of, of Horn argument is that we're doing it on a public health basis, something like that. So there are many examples throughout. Uh, the rationa under underlying the rationale was, um, was a political fear, I suspect. Um, the tactic that you're taking, that you have taken and others have taken, what the, is the, the shutting down the, the, the consequence of that, of that decision, of that action, of that very concrete, blatant uh, dismantling um, gives you sort of two options, it seems to me, uh, just for discussion. <laughs> One option in response um, is to uh, take them on politically. But that leads to, uh, I think, a necessity. I think they're outnumbered. You're outnumbered. You're outflanked. You're out everything. The, the other option is the one you're taking, and um, which is, uh, okay, well, like, like the youth in British factories, then you get together and you, 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 uh, you pursue history, as I would put it. Um, now to my question, or my thought. I mean, you see what you've done to me? Um, That's good context. <laughs> I lo I'm, I'm on the page with uh, the Mayan Mexican the concept and the Mayan principles, and soon I will be going down to Yucatan and discussing such things with uh, Mayan. Uh, 
th this may sound odd, but um, just for uh, for my, my thinking here, um, that's one path to take, and it's fascinating, and I and it just I become absorbed by it. But the other path, if you will, is sort of juxtaposing those concepts. You might c consider juxtaposing sociological concepts, just because that's sort of my my badge. Um, of structural equivalence of, uh, of uh, um, split labor market analysis. Instead of, instead of the path of uh, uh, common humanity, mm -hmm. you take the path of uncommon humanity. In fact, they have mm -hmm. power over you, and anything the kids do is going to be used against them and so forth. So I, I wonder, it's the, the, the goal, the objective, the end, not end point, but a, a point to get to, the moment, as you put it, to get to, might be might be at least adding to Mexican concept and Mayan concept um, social scientific analysis, which is a way to to meet head on the horn argument about uh, individuals mm -hmm. because that's their strategy, and in fact that is how not how I look at the social world. I'm sorry, but a common humanity God love, but not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. and. Um, but in my lifetime still, I see groups, boundaries uh, being maintained, not only by the, the, the members of that category or something themselves, but by the horn. Horn wants you to be, wants uh, Hispanic kids to be locked within Hispanic culture or something like that, but don't study it, don't become knowledge about it. Long-winded, but uh, I apologize. I, I, I totally, uh I totally agree. And one of the things that we were, we were um, to go back to the idea of uncommon humanity, which is interesting, is um, I, think, I think those things come, come to, can, can come together. And I think we were trying, I do we were trying to do that. So by, by establishing uh, a class climate, an environment where you felt um, as a student and, even, and as a teacher, I felt this way too, free, ironically. Uh, while we were under First Amendment chill, <laughs> but but uh, but to free to to explore, you you know, you didn't have to worry because if 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 that Inlakesh concept was rooted and and maintained and nurtured and grown amongst each other, you could be free to say whatever you wanted and without having any type of normal academic anxiety and fear as we have as students many times when we sit mm -hmm. in a classroom mm -hmm. in the hierarchies between teacher and student also um, feed that anxiety right I can't say that he's the teacher mm -hmm. and what we try to do is break that away mm -hmm. so that we could rehumanize ourselves through that rehumanization we must critically analyze our world to where that's not happening Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of places to look. Mm -hmm. I mean, it dramatically was put upon ourselves um, through, this, through these uh, legislative attacks and through the rhetoric that accompanied it. Um, but, it was all, but it was even before that happened, we were doing that in the classroom mm -hmm. because there's inequalities and injustices mm -hmm. and inequities everywhere mm -hmm. and rooted right in our own schools. And one of the things I love to do is ask my students, like, where's... How, how does this school happen? Where is school funding? You know, like, how is this school funded? Mm -hmm. And invariably, the whole class, or most of them would say taxes. And I go, good. What kind? And then silence, crickets, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, we know some things. Mm -hmm. We know enough to answer a question, but we don't, we, we don't practice inquiry into how these systems are built. So that's a moment of connection mm -hmm. they we all had school in common like how do you get on a bus and come someplace every day since you were five years old or walk to every day and everybody trusts it the move and you don't know how it works mm -hmm. and that freaked them out mm -hmm. because it's like something we just take for granted right you know but are all schools do they all look the same i would ask you know so those types of probing questions and then creating the cultivating their own and generating their own their own pursuit of their own inquiry that became the base those those were the, that's the basis of our the content of our classes it came from the students inquiry so they were looking at those moments of uncommon humanity 
And some, you know, immigration was always so, I mean, it's right yeah. there in, in our state, uh, and spe specifically in Tucson, where we're close, we're 60 miles from the, from the, from the imaginary line. Mm. And, uh, and the, so that, 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 that imaginary line has real impact, the policy of that has real impact upon the daily lives of our students. You know, I'd have classes where a student would obviously be having a rough day, and I would ask them to go out in the hallway with me, either emotionally or anger or disengagement. And we would go and have a moment to go talk. And I'd, you know, occasionally it was trouble at home. And that trouble was dad just got deported. Hmm. Or hmm. I don't, we don't know where he is. Hmm. That was a real life every day. I mean, not every day it happened, but a real life hmm. everyday context for what we were dealing with. So the students could see that uncommon humanity in their lives and breathe it in the air in Tucson. And, and I, would, I would conjecture you can do it everywhere. I would agree, uh -huh. absolutely. I, I, what intrigues me is that, um, that the students, uh, I was a substitute teacher in Oakland years yeah. ago, yeah. And, I, and like, wow. And so I, what, what fascinates me, which is probably not the right word, it, 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 it grips me, is that students, uh, we all do basically, but students come to uh, uh, the preliminary sp space that they, and I say preliminary for the moment, is that they come to things by way of their personal experience. Now, just to play devil's adv advocate for the moment, I would I, I might suggest that personal experience has a uh, has a is a powerful stimulant mm. uh, prompt, but it runs its course. And when that's an, another point, that to go from uh, their personal experience to the experience of an, almost negating their personal experience. And, um, be, and you can do that by way of metaphoric or analogical comparisons. You, you mean the other group, they were like mechanic institutes. Their books were taken away from them. So you, they begin to move out of their personal experience mm -hmm. and to a broader analytical yes. understanding. Absolutely. I mean, it, the anecdotal is powerful, you know, and, I, and I'm a personal believer in, 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 in empathy. And so the mm. key to empathy, and we would talk about this in the classroom because, you know, people are like, well, that's not got to do with, you know, your literature content and the skills and the standards. That has everything to do with it because if you're going to go and you're going to be a researcher one day and you're going to need to write and you, you learn, learn to write in my class, you're going to need to understand you're going to need to to understand an issue so well, um, so and, and create a, a, a culture um, where somebody feels listened to, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how you get qualitative data. Mm -hmm. um, and then and and, all, and and that goes through uh, numerous different disciplines too. But I just wanted to use that one just to, for simplicity's sake. Um, so the idea of listening to one another being the key to empathy, we would mm -hmm. we would overtly talk about that. Because we would be looking at these stories, these counter narratives, as mm -hmm. Delgado and Stefanczyk said, uh, you know, right in critical race theory, the idea of counter narratives, giving voice to the silence, the the uh, the, the, the uh, marginalized stories that, that that don't typically make it to, uh, especially, especially public school, the public school canon or mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, how powerful that is in legal scholarship, but also how powerful it is in an education context. So. By having those types of discussions in class, <coughs> then we can reach back and go, all right, now, now that we've emoted a bit, now that we felt we've been listened to, mm -hmm. now we can begin the analytical right. process. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can begin to go through uh, the, 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 the scientific process, if you will, the scholarly process. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it's also, you know, not to westernize this too much, to balance it back to our indigenous principles. Mm -hmm. the, fir the first concept that we would introduce, and it doesn't mean you, ha it, 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 isn't a, it isn't a linear type of, 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 uh, of paradigm, okay? But, but Tascalipoca is self-reflection, mm -hmm. all right? So that's important. So self-reflection is that piece where anecdotally or personally you can connect to something. Mm -hmm. But Quetzalcoatl is precious and beautiful knowledge. Well, where do we get precious and beautiful knowledge? from our lived experiences in the world, from others' experiences, mm -hmm. from listening to one another. That to me, and again, this is me and my, my, the way I internalize and, 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 uh, and, and uh, the, these concepts, that's analysis. 
That's mm -hmm. the beginning of developing an analysis. Right. And then we see La Pochli, that will to act, is develop analysis, create a plan, and then put that plan into action. Right. And that's just great scholarship, right? That's mm -hmm. just the ethical mm -hmm. things that we try to teach from, from kindergarten through, through your doctoral program about how you should go about doing your work as a scholar. So they really go hand in hand. Right. They're re they're, they're, they are humanizing. And there's, there's, there's also like a little Venn diagram between Western knowledge and pre-Columbian knowledge here in, 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 in this continent that we can like use both and empower mm -hmm. ourselves as human beings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is all of our history. This is all of our knowledge. And we get out of that hierarchical type of uh, epistemological debate about whose knowledge is, right, is exactly. valid right. and has value. And you could go to Confucian concepts. You could Absolutely. go to African concepts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can also go to your Eurocentric concepts, how they delimit and juxtaposing them to Confucian. I yeah. Mean, the, the opportunities are fascinating. Yeah, we have to create that. I mean, that is the true classroom. That is yeah. using the world as our classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, um, something I learned from our elders is like, the, the, the serpent, right, the koa, is the most precious, you know, entity on the earth, according to the Mexica, which falls in, which challenges the symbol, symbolism of, of you know, uh, Judeo-Christian view of the snake, right? Mm -hmm. So the koa is the reason why is because every, is all of its movement, it's embracing Mother Earth, Donatzin. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, if you embrace Mother Earth with all of your movement and you're with your entire body, you're going to soak up the most knowledge. And so that's, mm -hmm. a, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's a concept that I think, you know, we can bring to the classroom about respecting everybody's, respecting all forts, forms of, 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 of wisdom that, that people have gained mm -hmm. throughout, throughout time. And we shouldn't limit ourselves into these kind of nationalistic or, 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 or racial lenses that, that limit the way we, 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 we see the world. However, we must embrace those ethnicities on an equal level because there, there's wisdom from those mm -hmm. communities that, mm -hmm. that we need to, to put in the mixer. Right. You know, Curtis, one of the things that um, we like to do with this series is to uh, help our readers kind of get a personal look at the author behind the, the article. I was wondering if you could, uh, we have about five minutes left or so, uh, I was wondering if you could share uh, with our viewers something about your own background and what led you into teaching and uh, your own background. Um, I'm, I'm a biracial kid. Yeah, I'm not a kid anymore, but <laughs> just for the purposes of feeling better <laughs> about my long day ahead of me. Um, so I'm, you know, my mom's, uh, my mom's Swedish, you know, uh, a couple of generations back from Sweden. Um, and then I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Chicano, uh, Mexican-American. And I think that growing up, before we had the term biracial, we were halfies. We were, <laughs> we were whatever. We, were, uh, we didn't have names, but, but the world chose what we were, um, loud and clear. But I think that impacted me in a number of ways. It, it allowed me to, to, when I walked into a room, I always had to wonder how the people were going to see me. Was I not going to be white enough for this audience? Was I not going to be Mexican enough for this audience? And I shouldn't say audience, for this room of, of people. And regardless of how I was treated, that's how I had to walk. That's how I walked into those spaces. You know, uh, it, it's kind of a dark way of looking at the world. You know, that, that when you're a little kid and having to think about some room that's supposed to maybe embrace you and love you, that you that I was still a little bit shy and, and anxious about what, how I would be viewed. But it, it led, to, led to becoming a person that got to look at the world. And, and, and I love to talk, but I really learned to listen, too, because that way you learn. I had to listen to languages, because that was a key. That was, a, that was to where I was at. And I also had to listen to the way we communities talked about the other, because mm -hmm. that would also give me an idea about what was going on. And I think just that, that experience was, was one that led me to, to the way I view the world and the way, and, and the way I, when I was presented with these principles, I embraced them totally because it, it's a, it's a, it takes away that, 
that angst and that, that strange uh, alienation that I think some of us uh, feel as we grow up when we are uh, two different cultures and, or more. Mm. Uh, and my mom's a teacher. Mm. And my dad is, is, is a keen um, reader of the world uh, himself um, and just knows people and politics. He was a successful businessman, but, but he was more than that. You know, he, he could, every, everyone loved my dad who worked for him. And so I saw that. I saw how he had, con cariño. He would call people mija, mijo. Um, he would embrace them. And I watched that as a youth growing up, and I watched my mother as a kindergarten teacher who, 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 who just was uh, unbelievably loving and gracious, but also had, you know, wanted, had, ac had a academic rigor. You know, she, want, she was going to help kids read, and she was great at it. And those things formulated who I am, uh, those, those things, those people, mm -hmm. my family, mm -hmm. uh, my parents. Um, and, and, and I think um, being a comic book fan, I stumbled upon this through my own doctoral program. Um, for years, I would be asked in different veins to go through my literacy background, because that's a really good exercise for folks. How'd you learn to read and write? What did you read and write throughout? And I would, I, would, I, 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 told, I would say all the time that I stopped reading. I was a voracious reader when I was a youth, and then I stopped reading in middle school. And then finally, I was in a class with Dr. Sh Kathy Short, who is one of, on, my, on my committee, and I love her to death. She's a great teacher and such a smart woman. And, and I slowed down. For, Kathy got me to slow down and go, oh, no, I was reading comic books. So I really, that social justice streak in me, I think it's all Batman's fault. <laughs> I, I really do, you know. And, uh, you know, I was getting, there's, there's something to be said about, at least the time I was reading those, those books, mm -hmm. there's something to be said about standing up for folks that are, that are hurting, um, who need an advocate, who need a hero. And I don't have a Batman complex, don't, don't get, me, get me wrong, uh, or a Superman complex. So. But, um, but I remember going to Kathy, oh, like we were literally, like we looked at each other and went, that makes so much sense. So you never know. So when you challenge, like if, if there's some folks out there right now that are watching this and they're like, well, I wish you'd stop reading those things. You, you, you never know how, <laughs> how mainstream media might, might, might actually inspire some uh, Hopefully some folks think I've done some positive work and I, I, I anticipate, anticipate engaging this, in this struggle for equality and equity for our students uh, for the rest of my days. And, um, but uh, you never know. You never know. What are you doing now? I'm, uh, I think you've, uh, I'm supposed to be finishing my dissertation. So if, my, if, if this is online and my committee members are listening, yes, I'm doing that. <laughs> I am analyzing my data. It's taking a little bit longer. But um, I started... Uh, I had a need, I couldn't, I was literally banned from my curriculum. So um, I tried last year to teach without my 10 years of experience, of, like, because it was really, we were banned from the curriculum that we had created as Mexican American studies teachers. You were banned? Yes. By? Right. By the directives the given to me uh, from our district. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Anything that we had created as Mexican American studies teachers, we, <sighs> we couldn't. So I had this. All my depth of knowledge was pretty much chucked out, and I would have to start anew. So I gave that a shot, um, but it wasn't it was oh, it no, wasn't no. good for kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I tried really hard, and I think I still got them, you know, to 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 write, and, and they still gained some skills. But it was kind of like feeling like somebody telling me, "Go dig a ditch." I'm like, "Sweet, I got this backhoe here. I can I can I can get that di ditch dug. It'll be beautiful. It'll be strong. Be whatever you want it to be, and I'll be done in minutes." And they're like, no, here's a spoon. And so it, it was, I was fascinated as an educational researcher because I'm like, oh, let's watch at, at me as a test case. So I kind of was outside my own self going, let's watch him struggle without his curriculum. Mm -hmm. You know, let's see how much of his pedagogical and how much of its curriculum. And really what, we, what, I, what I found out, and I wasn't really doing a study, but I was still studying, still reflecting, still practicing Tezcalipoca. There's a real marriage between an, a learner, an educator, mm -hmm. And what and and, and and their tools. It, it's mm -hmm. like Picasso and paint and a canvas. Uh, it's like uh, Rodin and in and, 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 and the, and the, and the marble. It, when you take one of those elements away, it you suffer. So I decided to try to take this 
where, where, can, where can I be effective now? And so I'm, I'm uh, doing education consulting work and um, just starting my, my, my business. And uh, it's b designed around empowering teachers to feel this about themselves, where they can, they can have the mindset of tapping into the, the, the community and the, the resources and the cultural capital of the students to, to create empowering spaces that are rigorous and filled with academic uh, um, uh, achievement. And, uh, and I'm, I'm visiting, I've been, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have some jobs in uh, Connecticut and to South Dakota. I'm going to New Mexico uh, next month. Uh, but um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wild world out there. And I just, it feels good um, to know that people are embracing these concepts that are, that are currently banned in, in Tucson at home. It's it's a it's the best type of retribution and revenge <laughs> is to mm -hmm. plant the seeds elsewhere and watch them grow, as right. my friend Jose and compañero Jose says in the film Precious Knowledge. I was always often curious about why, how did they justify banning Shakespeare's Tempest? <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, that was a m my move. Uh, I couldn't yeah when they when they gobbled us dead that night on Jan uh, January tenth. Uh, 2012, I leaned over to my one of my compañeros and I said, uh, "I'm gonna get a Shakespeare banned tomorrow. Watch, because they had to. They had to if they were following their own resolution, which mm -hmm. is that shows you the absurdity and the, the absurdity right. of the law. So the Tempest is is Shakespeare. I, I don't know why we don't teach the Tempest as a as like a staple classic Shakespeare experience for all." United States of American students because because it's about contact it's about Europeans coming to this and it's the only time that you, this this uh, this continent and and it's the only time Shakespeare wrote anything that was topical and timely because he was a smart businessman he wanted to write those comedies and those histories that made the queen and the king look all oh yeah we want more of that right you know your, your great grandpa look at what he did he was great <laughs> um but but on his last play he decided to show a little bit about how he saw the world what was going on it's fascinating so it's about colonization mm -hmm. it's about the enslavement of two of the natives so how the heck am i supposed to teach that when um when i was being told to avoid ev anything about ethnicity or race Oppression <laughs> class. That was the advice I was given at that same meeting. Advice and or dictates? It, it started, that was the day after oh. the gavel, so it was really nice at that point. Everybody was feeling, that was, I knew that was going to be the most humanizing moment I was going to have with the administration uh -huh. in my building because it was like everybody knew the injustice that was un being unraveled, I mean, being unfurled in, in front of us. Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was advice at the time and that became d d edicts. <laughs> And so you can't, I, I wasn't safe to teach Shakespeare mm -hmm. under the, those conditions. Is it the consequence would be losing your job. More than that, it would be violating state law and being prosecuted. Oh well, my. let's, uh, <laughs> I hate to end on that, <laughs> Mark. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we could go on and on. <laughs> but uh, we're, I think we're out of time. Um, let me thank you again for joining us and for sharing your your thoughts with uh, with our audience. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor and uh, spending uh, spending time with you all. Uh, it it was a it was a pleasure as well. Thank you, John. No, thank both of you. <laughs>